It's time to make a custom M3 thread. Here's the next version of the watch. And one thing that's different about this version is that instead of using screws to hold the back onto the case, we had, I think, six before. The back itself is threaded. So that means we need to create threads here and create threads there. This is 27 millimeters in diameter, so I have chosen to use a half millimeter pitch, which means this is 27 by 0.5. And in the previous episode, I showed the equations we can use to calculate the threads, given different tolerances, grades, etc. In this episode, what I want to do is to figure out what is a good set of grades and tolerances to have the right fit between the back and the case. To test the threads, I've created these test parts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mill these out of aluminum and try different thread combinations and figure out what's correct. I have a bunch of aluminum. Aluminum is a lot less expensive than stainless steel. This part here represents the back. And this represents the front. There's no opening on the back right now because my goal is once I figure out the threads and then the O-ring between these two halves, the next thing I'm going to focus on is figuring out the right dimensions for gaskets so I get good watertight seal on this and so I can do depth testing. Now if we look at the back, the back presents an interesting challenge which I've taken care of with this undercut right here. The issue is that the thread mill has a 60 degree V shape and then there's a flat part here. And so there's a limit to how far down the thread mill can go before it would hit this section here. This undercut is meant to be about the same depth as the threads and yet the idea here is that when we have the threads from the front they will go all the way to this edge here. So if we did not have this undercut, it means that those threads would basically hit against the material and keep it from screwing all the way down. So that's why I added this undercut. So I made this undercut 0.533 millimeters tall. And the reason for making it that height is that's a little bit taller than the thread would be uh, cutting it with the thread. And this thread mill is designed to cut uh, the full depth, so I figured that would be about right. Now because of that, if we look here, the total distance that we have left is 0.667 millimeters, and so that means we're going to have slightly more than one thread on here, which isn't a whole lot. I've looked at other watch cases, and that seems to be about how it's done on other watch cases. Now if we look at the front, uh, for the front what we can do is, rather than having a relief in here, we can simply have this cavity go farther down, and therefore we can thread far enough down so that the threads from the back can fully engage and there will be a little bit of thread left. My starting point to decide on what threads to use is this chart here. This is really about how much engagement you have of the threads. In this case is obviously short. I decided to start with something that was in the middle of the range. So I decided to start with uh, 6G for the external threads and then 6H for the internal threads. Here's a spreadsheet that I put together that used the, the equations that I derived from my previous video. And there's also a link below in the description to my blog post that has that information. There was one small error that I had in the previous video, which I have corrected in the blog post. So please check that out for the latest version. If I find anything else, I will update it there. So this is what we have for 6G and 6H. These are the numbers that I pulled from the corresponding tables in the machinery handbook. And so these are the numbers that I will want to enter into Fusion 360 for the diameter of the boss. That will be the external threads on the back. And then this is going to be the diameter of the bore on the case. Likewise, this is the distance that I'll use for pitch diameter offset. Sorry, this one right here, and this one right here, in Fusion 360. In the CAD, I've set this up so that everything is driven by a set of parameters. And so here I have external major, internal minor, external pitch diameter offset, and internal pitch diameter offset. Uh, and this, by the way, is how I calculated the external relief depth, which is this distance right there. So going back to that 
the relief depth is half of the pitch diameter offset, which makes sense because the pitch diameter offset is the diameter, and this is radius, which is how far we want to go on. And then I also went in an extra two thousandths of an inch just to be a little bit safe, so that there wouldn't be any chance of binding of the threads. One of the things that I mentioned in the previous video is that sometimes end mills don't go to a sharp point, but in my case I was assuming it, it did. Now here's a photo of the actual thread mill, and you can see that it does go to a point. Now I've found that using the thread mills that are in Fusion 360 doesn't produce as accurate results in the simulation as I would like. For some reason, this distance here is usually larger with the thread mills that are in Fusion 360, so it tends to say that it's running into the material when it really isn't. So what I did is I created my own form tool, and so this is based on some sketches, and you can see it has the shape and the dimensions, etc. These are all driven by some parameters, as you can see here. And to turn that into a form tool, you have to go to the manufacturer space, and then you can say form mill, select the profile, the axis of rotation, which is right there, and then the compensation point, which is right there. And then when you do that, it doesn't look like it did anything, but it actually did. If we go to the tool library and go to the tools for this document, it just created this tool right here. Now, I already had a tool created, which is the one that I used in the simulations, so I can go ahead and delete this because this was just the one I created for demonstration purposes. The next thing I want to do is actually simulate it. So if I go here and click on simulate, I want to move this fairly far to the right because that gives me better results. And then I found that if I colorize by operations, as you'll see, it produces an output that uh, is pretty smooth and it's a lot easier to see what's going on. So here's the crust that is what we would expect because we haven't cut to the full depth. There's no crust at the bottom because, again, it's a sharp tool. But the thing to notice about this is that there's really just barely more than one thread. So here you can see we have a full thread and a right there and then we have a partial thread there. And so there's not a lot holding it on, but as I mentioned earlier, I've seen other watches do this with this small number of threads, and it seems to work fine. This is like in this simulation of the internal threads, and I set up a cross section because it's easier to see what's going on that way. But you can see we have a larger crust here, which is exactly what we would expect for the internal threads. The internal threads have a larger crust, percentage of the crust, than the external threads. I think this is the first time using my Renishant probe to pick up the X and Y axis, and it's pretty nice. The first operation is a roughing operation. This is for the simulator back, and so it's basically cutting out the boss that will become the screw-on part of the, the back. And you can see here, it's now taking shape as the round back. It has to cut it in two passes. I'm being not at all aggressive in terms of the cutting. I prefer to be fairly light on the cuts rather than be aggressive with this machine. Running this operation was a little tense here because this slotting cutter gets right down to the surface and then cuts all the way in with the first pass, but it worked just fine. And then it's time for the M3 thread mill. And again, this goes down very close to the surface of the material. So there isn't a lot of clearance, but as they say, clearance is clearance and so this worked just fine. I set it up to do three passes. Here it's actually doing the third pass now, and this is where it's cutting the, the most material. The first two passes were fairly light. Then it's time to pick up the X and Y on the other piece, which is going to be the fake front. The first step is to deck off the top. I didn't show this in the previous operation because I forgot to turn on the air blade on my camera, so it was being covered in coolant. Next is pocketing out the hole uh, where the crystal would effectively go. 
Again, I was not being aggressive. I, I'm sure I could have cut this with more depth of cut each time. So it took quite a few passes to make it all the way through, but I'm only making a few of these, so I didn't bother to optimize the cam for this and just kept running the machine until it finished this up. And then a 2D contour to clean up the wall. And then milling the circular outside for the fake case. This doesn't really provide any value, but I decided to do it because it would allow me to see better what the gap looked like. And then thread milling the fake case. This has to go around a few more times because the thread goes down farther than it did on the back. On the back it can only go down 1.2 millimeters. Here we can go down farther. And then when I'm all done, I use the wash down hose to wash the most of the chips away before using air to clear the coolant off just the part before I take the part out of the vise. And so let's see how it fits. And it fits. <laughs> that's pretty cool. And uh, that's, it wiggles a little bit, you know, which is to be expected, but it's about the same as the commercial watch cases that I've tested. So I might make this a little bit tighter, but I'm not sure it really matters. Um, once it's uh, snugged down with the seal, it should be plenty of watertight. So I'm pretty happy with how that works. And I'm getting more than one turn because even though there is only one thread on here roughly, I have multiple threads here and this is able to go down farther. So that was a, a nice discovery. Now one of the things you notice there is that that was a little bit loose so I decided to make it tighter and therefore I decided to use this column here. In this column the smaller numbers mean it's a tighter fit. Also H means tighter fit than G. So for the external threads, I decided to use the smallest one here, which is right there, 3H and 6H. And then for the internal threads, I decided to go with 5H. I wasn't sure how tight that would be, so I didn't want to overdo it. And that's why I chose 5H. So before we used a tolerance and grade, etc., that was just a single letter and number like this, 5H. But as you saw previously, I decided to use 3H, 6H. Now when there are two sets like this, you're referring to these two different uh, tolerance values separately. So basically we're saying for TD2, we want to have tighter tolerance than for TD. And so I, I created this uh, little chart in the spreadsheet so that I could remind myself when I see 3H, it means that's for TD2, and when I see 6H, that's for TD. And so then I looked those values up in the machinist handbook, and these are the results here. And then I pasted those into Fusion 360, generated the toolpaths, and then created another set of test pieces. Here are the two versions that I made. On the left is the first version, and on the right, the version that's tighter. It's a little hard to tell probably from the, the camera, but I can definitely feel the amount of wiggle on this. And then if I go to this one here, it's a lot less wiggle. It's definitely not too tight, so I could probably go even tighter on this. But what I'm going to do next is, if I open this up, I'll show you. The next thing I need to do is put a groove either on this side or on this side. Oops, sorry about that. Either this side or on this side for an O-ring. And the O-ring will provide the watertight seal, seal between the two halves, between the back so the back and the case. Once I have that seal working, then the next thing I'm going to do, if I put this back together again, is work on the, the front. And what I'm going to be doing here is testing the different sizes for the gaskets to figure out what's the right tolerance for the gasket so that I get the, I believe it's a 100 meter rating on this. And 100 meters doesn't mean it can go to that full depth, which I covered in a previous video. Anyway, I'm quite pleased with how this uh, turned out. And as I say, the next thing is the O-ring and then the gasket. 
and at some point I'll switch to stainless steel for these tests. Once I've done those two, we'll be ready to make the next prototypes of the watch. Thanks for watching. Give me a thumbs up, comment below, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.